Hi, everyone. Uh, there is no sound because we are all currently muted. Uh, we will be starting soon. We're just waiting for more people to join. Good morning, good morning. I guess this is the right time to start. I will really start by welcoming everyone to today's session. As a way of uh, starting, I'm going to try and introduce myself. My name is Maritongi Setuaba. I am an employee in the Department of uh, Tourism. My role there is the Deputy Director General in the branch known as Tourism Sector Support Services. I'm responsible for a whole lot of things, but among some of the work that I'm responsible for is transformation of the sector, I'm managing responsible tourism projects in the department. I'm responsible for enterprise development, our skills development training. But one of the matters that I'm passionate about is the management of tourist guides affairs. I'm also responsible for tourism safety that is in terms of the programs that we are managing in the department, the programs better known as tourism safety monitors. 
I am not new to the Department of Tourism. I have been with the department for some time now as head of legal services. It was only in December that I got to be charged with this responsibility as the head of the branch in the department. Specifically, I want to welcome uh, our guest speakers, Professor Compton from the University of Cape Town. I want to welcome Professor Harris from the University of Pretoria, our tourist guides, our provincial registrars, my colleagues, government officials, the Field Guides Association of Southern Africa, who we are collaborating with on these initiatives. I want to welcome Mr. Francois Collin from the National Federation of Tourist Guides and Affiliates, who has graciously agreed to moderate today's session. We are pleased to report that we received an overwhelming response to our invite for this lecture series. Over 100 participants confirmed their attendance and we are quite excited to welcome each and every one of you today. We truly appreciate the keen interest that you are showing as guides, as the academia, as um, um, officials in, in, in government and every one of our stakeholders. We believe that you will truly benefit from this lecture series that we have specifically put together for you. We know that it has been difficult. It's been a difficult time for you, but we believe that the response we received to the guide lecture series is a sign that guides are ready to get back into the, the in, to get back into the swing of things. It's really exciting to see that we have not lost hope. In fact, we are gearing ourselves to be able to get back and do what we do better, which is a tourist guiding. With the easing of lockdown restrictions and the travel restrictions and the most recent pleasant announcement by the UK government, we believe that we are on a positive road to recovery as a sector. It is important that we all familiarize ourselves with the tourism recovery plan and also the government-wide economic construction and recovery plan, which enjoins all of us to put our best foot forward towards efforts to recovery in the country. And in preparation for operations, particularly in this sector, subsector, which is tourist guiding, I would like to take this opportunity to urge all guides who have not yet registered for our COVID-19 protocol training that we have offered. We had issued out an advert and requested those that are interested to register so that we can go through this training which we believe will make you feel confident when you guide your visitors through our country, that you and your visitors will be able to apply the measures, the health and safety protocols that have been put in place for all of us to be responsible and to combat the spread of COVID-19. Now back to where we are today, the department started the sessions some are live, like today's lecture, but others have been pre-recorded. And during the previous year, we focused on compliance issues related to operating a legitimate tourism business. We had invited speakers from uh, other government departments and also uh, uh, our, 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 our relevant um, uh, uh, institutions in terms of uh, how best to be able to um, operate a legitimate tourism business. We had invited small business development, CEDA, South African Revenue Services, to speak on quite a range of topics, including our associations who spoke very well in terms of 
some of the experience that they have and also uh, the, 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 the requirements that um, uh, they have observed have to be uh, implemented in terms of uh, guys operating legitimate tourism businesses. This year, our focus is on niche areas where we have brought in subject matter experts to share their knowledge and insights with you on a range of topics that relate directly to the work that you do as guides. This is really to ensure that your knowledge is refreshed, it is up to date, and most importantly, that the information that is shared on this platform will dearly enhance visitor experience. You will be able to provide quality services that will ensure that South Africa remains a top destination. In addition, for those of you who are planning on increasing your scope as guides, that is adding certain categories, additional areas, be it at sites or at provinces, or you're just looking for ways to enhance your offerings. I promise you this lectures will, lectures will definitely provide insights and it will, they will also allow you to improve your knowledge and skills as a guide. You have the opportunity to interact with the experts. You also have an opportunity to share your experiences with one another. At this stage, I will want to take this opportunity again to wish you well in your deliberations, to wish you well in absorbing all of the wisdom that will be coming from our experts and from uh, each one of you. Do enjoy the lectures that we have planned for you today and the ones that are still coming. I want to take this opportunity again to, to thank Professor Compton and Prof, Prof, Professor Harris for taking this time out of their busy academic schedules. I am a student um, as well. I'm taking my online examination at 11 o'clock this, um, this morning, just now as I get out of the, uh, the, the, the webinar. I know it's, it's, it's very, very hectic in terms of um, uh, the professor's um, uh, uh, academic schedules this time of examinations, but we are very grateful and thankful uh, that you had found it within your busy schedule to take time to uh, share with us insights in terms of your topics that you will be sharing with guys today. And I have no doubt that today's lecture will be a success. Thank you very much, Nya Bonga, Kia Leboga. I wish you all a good webinar, lecture, and I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of uh, Francois now, who is charged with the responsibility to moderate the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Okay, well, it looks like I can't start my video because it's locked from the other side, but this is Francois. I'm just gonna introduce myself quickly and I would like to thank, uh, okay, it looks like my video is now released. I can open it. There we go. Right, so I would like to thank uh, Ms. Setwaba for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Francois. I think some of you might know me as a tourist guide and others of you might know me from the National Federation of Tourist Guides and Affiliates, the NFTGA. Um, that's the hat I'm wearing today. I have prepared a little bit of an introduction, but uh, being a tourist guide, we all know that we don't normally stick to programs uh, unless we have to, because otherwise we get into trouble. So let me just tell you something quickly about the NFTGA. We are a nonprofit organization that concentrates on guide issues and we are integrated with industry. That means that we work with SATSA and to operators, but we are also responsive to government, which in this case would be the National Department of Tourism, NDT. And uh, if you want to know more about us and follow us, we interact mostly through Facebook. So you'll find us there. Right now, the big thing about guiding is that 
the guiding industry has often been very fractured and not as professional as it should be. And I think Mr. Twaba has touched on a lot of those points and on this lecture series. So we believe that guides should be more professional, they should be extremely versatile, and they should also be all around knowledgeable. And this series will obviously play a role in improving that and in upskilling guides. So we are ecstatic that the Department of Tourism is backing it and launching it. Right, um, so most people wonder what have guides been doing for the last 20 months? Well, for the last 20 months I've been learning to be a gardener, a plumber and all sorts of other things at home. But the important thing is at this stage, we need to be well prepared for the restart of tourism. And we also need to be aware that tourism will not be the same as what it was before. It is changing, not only because of COVID and lockdowns, but because times are changing and we need to be more prepared for what is coming. Right, um, in order to succeed, that means that we need to be more adaptable to change and we need to be excellent. That doesn't mean being a good guide, it means being much better than a good guide, it means being an excellent guide. So preparation is what makes the difference. You can be a very good guide if you have the right personality and you have the knowledge but preparation takes you that step further. Right, uh, a guide is a facilitator. That's more or less what I'm trying to do right now, although it's the first time I'm doing it. And that means that we need to be able to play all sorts of different roles. And if you're not doing that, if you're not uh, capable of shifting and being diverse, you could break the tour. So we need to have all the knowledge and all the capabilities so that we can make the tour, not break it. And that is one of the areas that the NFTGA tries to work in as well. It's upskilling. So let's start by introducing the speakers. Today we've got two speakers and they've both been mentioned already today. Uh, the first one will be Professor John Compton from UCT, the University of Cape Town. And he will be taking us on a journey to explore the natural wonders of the West Coast. So he will probably refer to it as natural history. Other people might refer to it as natural science. Um, and then we will have a second session and that will be Professor Corin Harris from UP, the University of Pretoria. I've had the pleasure of meeting her before and uh, interacting with her. And she will be taking us on, let's call it a time travel experience, uh, a tour through history where we will see the past in the present. So before I hand you over to the speakers, I need to set a couple of basic rules um, and some boundaries. The program has got slots for the speakers. We need to respect these, which means we need to keep our microphones on mute while they're doing their speech. Uh, there is an issue with bandwidth, uh, so keep your cameras off, although I think that's controlled from the NDT side, so you probably won't be able to switch on your camera anyway. Um, if you see that your, your sound has gone away or something is missing, you can log out and log back in again with your password. So it's not really a crisis. Then there are two slots for questions and answers. These slots are fairly short. So you can use the chat, the one that you've been using so far to introduce yourself. You can use that to post questions. The questions will be offline and the replies will be posted on the NDT website once this is done. So don't panic. If we don't get to your question during the short slot for questions, you can post the question and it will be handled offline. Right, now let me hand you over to Professor Compton from the University of Cape Town. And let's see if his presentation on natural science smashes the boundaries between culture guiding, nature guiding, and adventure guiding. Because we all know a guide needs to be versatile. Right, welcome Professor. Thank you. Good morning, Francois. Good to be here. All right, I'm going to get started. And to get started, I'm going to share my screen. If people have any issues with that, please relay that to the tech person. But here we go. I'm going to try to launch my PowerPoint presentation. All right, so hopefully everybody can see this opening slide. And what I want to speak with you today 
<clears throat> as was mentioned, is I want to take you on a little bit of exploring of uh, some of the natural wonders of the West Coast. Uh, I realize that many of you perhaps don't live in this part of Southern Africa, but hopefully many of you will get a chance to visit here and maybe act as tour guides as well here. And also maybe there are some general themes that will be useful to you uh, no matter where you are. And the, one of the efforts I've tried to make as a professor, having taught many, many students over the years, and I have interacted at least on many occasions with tour guides, and I would like to, as much as possible, convey information to everyone that they can better appreciate what they're seeing and what they're doing. And I think we're all very blessed to live in a country that has so much natural beauty. It really is something I have to remind myself almost on a daily basis, how fortunate we are to live in such a beautiful corner of the world. So that particular corner I wanna talk about is the West Coast. I'm gonna focus on the region fairly close to Cape Town. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about the West Coast, this talk is based in part on my most recent book shown here on the left, West Coast and Natural History. I will explain at the end of my lecture for those who would like to uh, learn more about it or how to get a hold of a copy, how you can do that. And the photo on the right shows the view from Signal Hill above Greenpoint. You can see Robben Island offshore, here's Table Bay. And the West Coast, you can see looking to the north, there's Bloberg along the coast, and there are these series of Darling Hills. So we're gonna venture up to some of this area and have a look around at some of the natural features. Uh, hold on. Okay. So this is a map just to orient you. Um, the one on the right shows you the Cape Peninsula. Here's Cape Town. And one of the beauties of living in Cape Town is there are so many wonderful options to show people such a wide range of really spectacular uh, scenery and environments. So I have given a series of talks. I've written a number of books. And I won't obviously have a chance to cover all those in this lecture. I'm just gonna to touch on a few, and that's gonna be the West Coast National Park, which is located about an hour, hour and 15 minutes drive north of Cape Town with Longabon Lagoon, Saldana Bay. And I'm also gonna to touch upon the West Coast Fossil Park. This is a relatively new development, one that I think a lot of people haven't had a chance to visit, and it's really, really a wonderful spot. This red line just shows you a quite spectacular route that you can take through the Cape Fold Belt, which are the mountains to the east of Cape Town, going past Paul Rock, through Baines Cliff Pass, Mitchell's Pass, through the Ceres Basin, the Haido Pass, through the Karoo Port into the Tonka Karoo. But that's another lecture and that's another topic. But again, if you're interested in that, most of that is covered in the book. And then this image on the, on the left just shows you a little more detail of even within just a very short half day trip, you can easily show people amazing things uh, at Bloberg, uh, within the Darling Hills, um, the Kwatu, which is a very nice, uh, re again, relatively new, although it's been around for a while, site that, uh, highlights the San heritage. Uh, so these are all really spectacular places to see. Right, so let's start with the West Coast Fossil Park. I don't have any idea how many of you have been there before, but I'd just like to give you at least a brief introduction. Uh, when you get there, what's nice is they have this new exhibitions amphitheater building with some beautiful little displays inside, which I'll show you just now. And then in the distance, you can see this white, sort of tent structure, and that is the dig site. And the story here is that this was originally a phosphate mine. 
all right? So for decades, it was actively mined as an open pit mine. And what they uncovered were fossils, this amazing fossil bed of just an enormous number of bones. And the paleontologists, the people who study ancient life, um, put these bones together and documented the occurrence of these short necked giraffes. Here's a wood sculpture of one up here in the upper right with one of the jaw bones up close. They uh, documented a different species of elephant than we have today, known as the gonfotheres. And they documented here in the lower right, Africa's only known bear. So it is now extinct, it doesn't live here anymore, but it was a very large, impressive animal. And just below the drawing by Cedric Hunter, you can see here's the jawbone. So it's really uh, quite an amazing thing to think about. And I think visitors are often really intrigued because you can enter into, this is now the interior of the tent and they've built a walkway around it. And what's beautiful is they've left most of the bones in place, but they've dug out to various levels and have exposed this really spectacular bed of fossil bones. And what people are sort of amazed is you can take this assemblage of bones and put together a reconstruction of what that area was like on the West Coast circa 5 million years ago. And this is again, the beautiful artwork by Cedric, the late Cedric Hunter. And you can see that the West Coast, not only was it a very different environment in terms of the plants with palm trees and very large trees, it also had a completely different uh, menagerie of animals, uh, most of which no longer live today, like the bear that I mentioned and those gonfotheer elephants and the short-necked giraffes. Those are all extinct, but they of course live on in the animals that came from them, that evolved from them. So we have the modern day elephant, we have the modern day giraffes, etc. So this is in the exhibition hall. Here's the Civetheer, beautiful wooden sculptures of what these animals look like. Below that is a close-up of some of their bones with their large teeth. And you can see they were on the left, you can see how big they were. Here's a human skeleton below and adjacent to a civetheer, they were really large animals. And this is telling us that there was a very rich vegetation during that period for them to thrive. Now the bone that is a bit controversial, one of the ideas is that it could have been related to a water hole in which animals would have come to drink and those that died would have uh, accumulated there at the water hole and been trampled upon over time and eventually buried and preserved this fossil bed. It's still a bit of a debate exactly how the fossil bed formed, but it's an interesting topic to present to people when they visit. And then also within the amphitheater are beautiful uh, photo montages. These are huge, uh, they, the scale is huge. You can see here the interior of the room, these beautiful images depicting the life as it was so long ago. Here's an example of the extinct African bear. You can see how large it was, significantly larger than a human. And this is the fossil jawbone of one. And here is an artist reconstruction at the time. Now, physically the location of the fossil park is this number one, this red dot right here, number one. And what this slide tries to show you is variations in the shoreline. So in the dash line offshore is where the shoreline would have been when sea level was 20 meters lower than it is today. And this solid line is where it would be when sea level was 40 meters higher than today. And the indication is that at the time, five million years ago, sea level was somewhere between 25 and maybe 40 meters higher than today. And so the 
Um, Cape Columbine Peninsula was actually then an island. You had a narrow seaway between Soldan, what is now Saldana Bay and St. Helena Bay to the north. And then here's the Berg River. And some people have proposed that the Berg River flowed through to the site in the past. Uh, I tend to believe that it was actually a water hole and that the Berg River at that stage was still had its major flow to the north. But it's intriguing to think about how the landscape has changed over these long, deep time scales. Now, we know, of course, from fossils about the gomphothere elephants. There are different species of elephant than the ones that live there today. And we also know that we have these amazing examples of rock art. This is the one at Stotzel uh, in the Cedarburg Mountains, where you can see the depiction of a small herd of elephants uh, and people. And of course, when the first Europeans arrived, we know of written records of people who saw uh, herds of elephant. These are examples of, in a way, written or art records that our ancestors who were living here also saw herds of elephant. Another quite amazing organism that used to live is the now extinct longhorn buffalo. So here's a human on the far left. Here's a modern day. African buffalo, which is a big and quite, you know, scary animal, can be. Uh, and here's a depiction in outline form of the size at the same scale of a modern one of this extinct longhorn buffalo. Look at the size of those horns. That's based on fossils. And you can see they have a span of over, around 2.4 meters. So, really, an incredible animal. This is it in a rock art depiction uh, from North Africa, from Libya. So that was one of the animals that used to live uh, here up until about 10,000 or so years ago. And also the Cape Mountain zebra, which we know uh, has been preserved and we still have with us today. There's actually a giant Cape zebra that has now gone, is now extinct, also went extinct about the same time as the longhorn uh, buffalo. And then most of you have probably heard of the Chaka, uh, closely close relative of the zebra um, that went extinct in historical times. Here's a photo of it at the London Zoo, uh, one of the last survivors. And there have been attempts to try to recreate the Chaka through breeding programs. And here's a photo here that shows you through breeding of zebras and selection, you can start to get at the, more, the pattern of stripes that resembles that of the ancient Quecha. Now, it's one thing to selectively get something that looks like a Quecha, but actually whether or not it behaved and acted like a Quecha is another matter. So it's not really satisfactory uh, in terms of, take, of um, replacing that extinct species. And what we all know is that extinction is forever. You can't, once animals go extinct, you can't really get them back. And so it's very important then that we conserve those that remain, such as the Cape Mountain zebra, which came close to extinction in the past, but through conservation effort, efforts was retained. This is just a photo in the lower left here of the feral horses in Namibia, uh, leftovers from when the Germans uh, occupied Namibia, and they uh, exist in the southern areas of Namibia. And then here's a picture of when you breed a horse and a zebra, you get something that's called a zors or a hebra. And you can see it has these different combination of features. The other area on the West Coast that's quite interesting is Elon's Fontaine. It's located just to the south of the West Coast Fossil Park and to the uh, east of Longbon Lagoon. It's famous for its um, exposed dune areas of fossil artifacts. And most famous, shown here in the upper right, is the cranium, the skull cap 
of what's deemed a Saldana man. You can see this is only a partial, but you can see the very prominent brow ridges. And this was this is probably the species Homo heidelbergensis, which was the species that evolved from Homo erectus. And it's the species from which we Homo sapiens would eventually evolve from. And on these deflation surfaces, you can find beautiful examples of stone artifacts. Here's a hand axe, sort of the teardrop shape. Here's another smaller hand axe here and other bones and fossils that are exhumed there. Okay, and then you don't have to go far. In fact, it makes for a good full day visit to do half a day at the West Coast Fossil Park. And then you're within 10 or just 15 kilometers going to the West to get to the West Coast National Park. And this is a beautiful aerial photo that I got from the park. And it shows you a view looking north. So at the very southern end is the Hillback Farm and the salt pans. You can see the beautiful subtitle channels in the dark blue. The white are the sand flats, the intertidal sand flats that are exposed through the tidal action. And then it communicates with Saldana Bay to the north and gets flushed with seawater through the channel into the Atlantic Ocean. Also along the coast, you have um, the Rocky Headland here at the northern end of 60 Mile Beach and these beautiful beaches, 16 Mile Beach that runs from here all the way to Esterfontein, the coastal town to the south. And it's got a beautiful dune ridge. Uh, and I'll just mention a few features here. We'll start, I usually start with uh, going up to the top of Seaburg. Uh, here's Seaburg here. It's got an old herder's hut on top with some very nice uh, posters in it that give explanations of some of the features that can be seen. And from here, you get beautiful views. This is the view looking west over to Coral Bay and Postburg, which many people will go to during flower season to see the beautiful Namakalan daisies. And these are beautiful outcrops of the granite. So the granite is about 540 odd million years old. It, it intruded at depth below the uh, deep in the Earth's surface and has gradually been eroded and exposed at the surface as these hills. So Posberg are granite hills. Seaberg is a granite hill. And you can see it has this distinct weathering feature that allows it to break off into these segments and they are rounded and shaped like boulders. And these little black specks, I don't know if you can see them on this particular exposure of the granite. These are, of course, the Dossies, the Rocks Hyrax, uh, very familiar to the West Coast. And if you look up close on the granite, you can see the crystals within it, but you can also notice the beautiful array of lichens. These are algal fungal symbionts that are the first life form to colonize hard rock surfaces. And you can see uh, just in this image alone, we've got a number of different species, orange, peach colored, green, white, black. So very rich, interesting features that if you get people to look up close, they'll see it. If you don't mention it to them, they probably won't notice it. And then off of Seaburg, you get these wonderful examples of what's known as the Strandfeld vegetation. This is the coastal bushland, some lovely bushes, uh, many of which produce berries. The berries attract birds, and of course, tortoises, the angular tortoise, famous in the West Coast uh, National Park. The other interesting feature here are the dunes, and you can visit the major dune field, which is known as the Hilbeck Dune. If you go to the Dunebos campsite, their uh, lodge area, there is a trail you can take and you can enter into this very large dune field, which is active. And if you go in summer and the wind's honking, the, the people will get a real experience of being sandblasted by the sand on the moon. And this photo in the upper left shows you some archaeologists and geologists exploring this exposed base of the dunes where the 
coarser material that the wind can't blow away form fossils and records of what lived here before. So for example, they have found the bones of hippos within this surface, on this surface, indicating that this area once used to be wet enough to support uh, herds of hippo, and that people occupied this site at least back to about a quarter of a million years. And these dunes are moving at a speed of about five to 10 meters a year. And you can see from the scale of the people here that these are impressively large bodies of sand. And one way we can understand this dune field, uh, which is basically to the um, east of Longamon Lagoon, is it initiates at the southern end of 60 Mile Beach, just off the beaches north of Aesterfontein. Uh, and part of that's because you have a rocky headland here, and part of it's because you have Dawson Island offshore. And what Dawson Island does is it takes up much of the wave energy, just as the headland does, and creates an, a low energy wave shadow. And this part of the beach then develops very fine sandy beaches and that fine sand when the southeaster blows in summer can easily transport it through this tongue of sand which dates back to about five or six thousand years old and is gradually moving to the north and if it continues to move to the north it will eventually run into St. Helena Bay to the north. The other interesting uh, feature of the dunes that is often quite clearly displayed are these huge dune mole rat mounds. And if you're lucky, you can see one being excavated as these tubes of sand get pushed out. And early visitors found these quite annoying because horses would step into them and made it difficult to travel. Uh, so it was known as the kingdom of the mole. And then if you go to the southern end of the lagoon, this is an aerial photo on the <clears throat> left showing you the large salt marshes and, and so forth. And this is a close up on the right. This is the Heelbeck Visitor Center here. Um, and that's worth a visit. And the walk out onto the bird walk is beautiful. You go out on the wooden planks above the salt marsh. You're not allowed to walk on the salt marsh because you'll trample it to death but it's made up of this beautiful carpet of what we call salt loving or tolerant halophytic vegetation. And there's amazing, of course, bird life there. So many visitors uh, enjoy this site for its beautiful carpet of plants and of course the thriving bird communities. And these are just a few other views you get when you get to the end of the boardwalk, you can go out in the lagoon, often see flocks of flamingos. This is the uh, eelgrass, which grows at that interface. And then looking inland, you can see the Spartina and Juncus plants in the back. And then the freshwater seep is indicated here by this light colored yellowish uh, Phragmites, the freshwater reeds. And that's of course why Hill, Hillbeck was where it is, is because they were able to find decent water. And then if you go further up the peninsula towards Pottsburg, you get to Crawl Bay. And there you can see beautiful examples of the intertidal sand flats. If the tide is low, you can walk out and see the amazing burrows of the sand prongs. And uh, occasionally you'll find these interesting circular feeding traces shown here in the lower left of the flamingo as it stands there and uh, takes out buckets of sand with its beak. The other interesting site at Crawl Bay has to do with the actual picnic site here. Many people go down and picnic. And by the way, in the parking area, they put up very good information posters. So um, those are definitely worth it for people who want more detail. This is where the creek stool is. That's the Postburg Granite Hills in the distance. And here you get a beautiful exposure of older deposits that were made previously here and now been reoccupied by the sea. So one of the th things this site is famous for, the footprints, Eve's footprints that you may have read about, 
dated to around 120,000 years ago. And they are trace fossils and trace fossils of footprints, which might sound rather amazing that those can survive. But this is a photo of other footprints, not human footprints. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is on a fallen slab of the rock. And originally this was a dune sand. And this looks like it was probably a hyena. And the footprints are not very well preserved, but what is well preserved is this ridge of downslope deformation. So if you think about stepping into sand, you form that ridge of sand on a slope. And then what probably happened was it got rained on and then preserved as other sand covered it up and got buried and formed a fossil. Doesn't happen often, but can happen. Um, and then nearby, up higher on the bluff at Crawl Bay, you can find what are called shell middens. Here's an example here in the upper left. This would be limpets, uh, paralamin, mussel shells that people would have collected on the Atlantic seaboard side, carried over here, and so, and had their lunch or supper, and they would have left this as their rubbish. And so in a way, this has been a popular picnic site for at least several millennia, several thousand years, quite amazing. At Church Haven, you can see these weird circular patterns uh, of cemented sand that um, some people originally thought were petrified tree trunks, but I suspect they are the pipes, the feeder pipes of springs. So remember, we had hippos living here in the past, and it might have been much wetter and had more water. Another amazing thing about Crawl Bay is you can see examples of what was living here 125,000 years ago. These are the burrows of the Calyanassa shrimp preserved in the sand from 125,000 years ago. And you can see, um, evidence of windblown sand here, dune deposits that are now preserved as rock. And you can also find fossils of the razor clam shown here and the oyster that no longer live there, but used to live there in the past. So it's like a record of how the lagoon has changed through time. And we can understand this record from the history that we know of sea level. So, what this tries to show you here in the lower left, this is a plot of sea level through time. So here we are today at zero. And if you go back to 125,000 years ago, you're at the last time sea level was this high as today. And you had a lagoon and you had these deposits that we see there exposed today. They formed during this time. Then ice grew in the Northern Hemisphere, the sea level dropped and the water left. There was no lagoon, no ocean. The ocean was offshore. And then eventually the ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere melted and the sea level rapidly rose back up to where it is today. And so what we have is a beautiful example of when the ocean was here 125,000 years ago and when the ocean, of course, is here today. So it's a wonderful example of showing people how we can understand the past through looking at the present and understanding how things like sea level have changed through time. And then if you go over to the Atlantic side, that's also quite spectacular. There's these beautiful dune ridges on the coast. And this is from the Zarbank Rocky Headland at the northern end of the uh, 16 mile beach. And you can see here on the left, various stages of vegetation growth reflecting the various ages of the dune sand. So where the dune sand is the oldest, towards the lagoon side, you see well vegetated leached calcareous sands. And as you come towards the coast, you see less and less well vegetated and more and more calcareous um, soils. And this is quite spectacularly shown in this photograph. This was taken during flower season. So you see the Macallan daisies in the foreground. And in the background is this big, you know, 
10 meter high wall of sand that's on the move. And it's uh, moving out over this older mature growth of strand felt vegetation. And in the process, burying it alive sounds terrible. But then what happens is you get different types of plants that colonize the dune surface that are adapted to windblown sand and harsher conditions. So quite an interesting contrast. And these dunes can be dated. We've dated them with um, dating the fossil shell material. And uh, they date back to the time that we know sea level rose back and formed dunes along the coast. And we can document that people were living here from the various shell middens with firestones and these limpid shells where they ate the seafood along the coast. And these date um, back as far as 6,000 years ago. So quite an amazing record there of human occupation. And of course, not only humans eat the shells, but seagulls as well. So you can get these surfaces that are just covered with the white muscle. And that's from the gulls uh, lifting the mussel shells out of the surf zone after a storm, and they drop them from high above to crack them open to get at the meat inside. So the West Coast uh, National Park is a wonderful spot. It's, it's got so much to see. It of course doesn't really have the big five. It's got those anglet tortoises, it's got the dossies, it's got these, uh, the ostrich is quite common there. You'll maybe see some eland. I've seen um, Cape, uh, Mountain Zebra there as well. I've even seen a caracal once. So I think the beauty of it is in the wide open spaces and of course the beautiful vegetation and the strong contrast between these environments of the lagoon, the sand dunes, the big coastal wave systems along the coast. And it's really a very rich and enriching place uh, to have a look. So strongly recommended. And then um, that really sort of ends what I wanted to try to present to you about some of the features of the West Coast. There's obviously a lot to explore uh, beyond those two sites. And um, this is a aerial shot from a satellite from NASA and quite a spectacular image of all of Southern Africa. And so beyond, so way down here, just above Cape Town, this is where we were at Saldana Bay. Uh, you can go Florin Flay, the Lafonte River, Van Rhines Pass, Springbok, the Orange River, I Ice, Luteritz, the Nandem Sand Sea. So there's a lot to explore on the West Coast. And in my view, it's underappreciated. There's so much to see there and so much to do. So if you're interested in learning more about the West Coast in terms of its natural history, um, this is my latest book, The West Coast, which I introduced earlier. This has just been published this year. Um, it, as all the others, are full color uh, guides or books about what you can see there. Uh, earlier, and some of you might be familiar with this one that I wrote on human origins, uh, how diets, climate, and landscape shaped us, provides new perspectives on human origins within in Southern Africa, and talks a lot about the most recent evidence that's been coming out of the South Coast, near Pinnacle Point at Muscle Bay, and other key sites that really shed some new insight into humans, and who is living here, and how they might have, might have evolved, and what is the significance. So if that, that interests you, that's that book. And then more uh, specific to Cape Town is my original book, Rocks Mountains of Cape Town. And that tries to explain you know, things like why Table Mountain is flat, and so forth. Um, if you're interested in any of these books, you can visit my website, uh, johnscompton.com. On, at that website, you'll also see links to other resources. You can download blog PDFs about different topics. You can watch YouTube videos on why Table Mountain is flat. You can also find links there to talks I've given to other groups that have been recorded. So during COVID, a lot of the talks I gave were recorded 
And if you're interested in learning more about those topics, you can find the links on my website and they you just click on them and they should take you uh, to those features. And then if you're interested in the books, there's a, a order form you can download. It's a refillable PDF. So you can just type directly onto it and give me your details. And um, if, you, if you live locally, there's no delivery charge or otherwise you can have it shipped by courier or to a pep store uh, for 60 bucks. So this is, I guess, the silver lining for all of us in COVID has been a chance to maybe, yeah, regroup, rethink, relearn, retool, uh, a chance to consolidate things and so forth. So I hope, I wish you great luck in restarting the tourism. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to do tourism. And I wish you all the best. I'm gonna stop, uh, hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And you, uh, I open the floor to questions. So I'm very happy to take any questions that someone may have. If you have a question and it doesn't get answered, you're also welcome to um, put it into chat and the conveners will send me the chat record and I will try to respond to your questions through uh, email. Or you can always email me your questions. So um, yeah, if anyone has a question, just uh, raise your hand or uh, unmute yourself. I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but uh, maybe pick the raise your hand feature and then we'll get to you. Hi, right, Professor, well, it's from you. <laughs> yes, Prof. Uh, Francois here. We actually have several questions that have already been posted uh, okay. while you were speaking. Great. And I've got a short list of them. Um, I think, let me start with uh, the easiest ones first. There was one posted in the chat, which was approximately how long ago did the animals go extinct? Now, I know this is a very wide question because you touched on extinct elephants and quaggas. So I think maybe if you choose three of the species that you mentioned and you give us an approximate timeline. Yeah, well, the, the animals, of course, are constantly evolving, right? So as I mentioned, if you go back 5 million years ago, you had this amazing assortment of amazing animals and almost all of them are gone. They no longer exist. And that's because um, through time, the climate changed, various things happened. And of course, the gomphotheria elephants eventually would evolve into the African elephant, which we all know and love. And we know it lived on the West Coast before, you know, until recently, until they were all killed locally, unfortunately. Um, and other animals, um, so all those animals were evolving through time. And we know from a number of fossil sites uh, how the animals were turning over, how certain animals would die out. So the civet ears, for example, the short necked giraffes, they appear to have lasted till about one or two million years ago before they went extinct. Um, and then other ones are more recent. Um, the more recent ones are the Huaja, which historically, of course, was here. Also the blue antelope, many of you may have know about the blue antelope, which was also living here when the Europeans arrived. And through people over hunting them, through people capturing them for zoos overseas, they were put under so much pressure that they eventually uh, went extinct just within the last, you know, several centuries. I hope that answers the yeah, question. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to take another one. Yeah, that answers it beautifully. I think uh, the person that posted the question will be happy. Uh, there was another question which is related to that one about selective breeding. Um, basically, quaggas, we, we had a program to try and reinstate the quagga. So the question was, does it happen through artificial insemination? Ah, good question. Um, sorry. Uh, good question. I'm not sure. I know that that program has been going for several decades. 
I know that they have been successful in terms of generating, you know, an animal that looks similar to uh, quokka. But as I mentioned, you know, that's the outward appearance of an animal. And so much of an animal in its genetic makeup is not expressed as an exterior feature. Um, so we don't really know really if that was like a huaca, probably not. It probably behaves more like a zebra, which has weird stripe patterns. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, but I don't know about the artificial insemination. Okay. Then there are two questions about lichens. Uh, one of them was if you could briefly explain what a lichen is, and the other one is how did they evolve in the Seaburg area? Yeah, so the lichens are amazing, and you probably have seen them many, many times and just didn't know what you were looking at. They're that crusty, flaky <coughs> sorry, thing that grows on rocks. So they are, the, they are a, uh, what's called a symbiotic relationship in that the fungus and the algae live together. And each one gives the other things that it needs. And so they form this relationship that's been very successful. And they've been around for a long, long time by, on the Earth's surface. And the key feature of them is they're very adapted to being able to colonize bare rock, which very few plants are able to do, right? Because there's no soil. There's nothing for them to really sink their roots in. We've all seen some of the trees that grow uh, through putting their roots through the rock. But the lichen lives right on that surface. And as part of its experience of living on that surface, it starts to break down the rock. And it's the <clears> first <throat> organism then to start to create soil. And of course, soil will then eventually allow the moss and grasses and bigger plants to come in. So lichens are, are amazing. You'll see them on tombstones. You'll see them growing on some uh, buildings. You'll see them growing um, on most bare rock surfaces. Okay. Then uh, you did mention the footprints. Uh, there was another question at the end that asked precisely where the footprints are. But the first question was, as the soils of Kral Bay are sensitive, um, does that mean that walking on the sand flats uh, would be uh, detrimental uh, by causing deformation of the soil? Um, people can walk on the intertidal sand flats. So if you want to wade out into the lagoon itself where there's just sand, that's fine. What you, what you shouldn't do is walk on the vegetation, which lives right at the edge of the lagoon where it forms salt marsh. So, because that tramples it and kills it basically. So the park doesn't want people walking on the salt marsh, the plants. Um, and that's why they've built these wooden boardwalks which allow you to walk just above them. And trust me, you don't really wanna walk in the salt marsh because it's got this, the salt marsh acts to capture the fine mud. So it's got this black gooey mud uh, that you'll get uh, step into. Um, in terms of the footprints, those were originally found uh, just right near Crawl Bay. The original footprints were cut out and you can see them on display at the Zico Museum in town, in Cape Town. And they found other human footprints, which they, um, covered back up and have preserved. So they didn't take those out. The ones that I showed you were not of human footprints. I think they're of like a hyena. Um, and they are exposed there. Um, they're eroding. So they're maybe not as in great a condition as they were originally, but they are there and you can see them. They're sort of just uh, before the preak stool. If you look carefully, yeah. Okay, there's another direct question that has been posted, which is, uh, is there a common link on the West Coast with the Atlantis dune system? Uh, because it is formed throughout the position of Robben Island. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that question. So you might be able to 
Elaborate yeah, I think, I think I know what they mean. And remember I said that the Hilbeck dune field is a result of, da of Dawson Island to the north off of Eisterhunden. Um, and in a similar way, the Atlantis dune field reflects Robben Island, right? Because Robben Island also creates a wave shadow um, of the incoming large swell, <clears throat> which breaks that energy of the waves breaks on Robben Island. And then there's a shadow zone that extends over to um, Kuberg, Kuberg Beach. And there the sand is very fine and that's where the wind blows it off Kuberg Beach and forms the Atlantis dune field, which you can also visit. I don't know how easy it is to get in there anymore, but they used to have raves and all sorts of things in there. And I don't know what how access is now, but you can also visit the, um, reserve associated with Cooper. You have to be comfortable with seeing a nuclear power plant <laughs> nearby, but it's a beautiful nature reserve because it's basically untouched by people outside of the power plant. So that's another area that's worth a visit. Okay, well, we still have about five minutes. So let's see what other questions we have. Okay, this is one of the topics that you haven't touched in your presentation. The kiln ovens along the West Coast uh do you know where they can be seen close up uh, and what their purpose was yeah you can see the old kilns um they're preserved there along the road that takes you from the r27 into the town of longabon oh no 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 sorry sorry <laughs> not longabon acerfonte so if you're on the r27 and you get to the intersection you can go either to Darling, Darling or you can go to Esterfontein. Take the Esterfontein Road towards Esterfontein. You'll see them along the roadside. They have several and they're well displayed right on the roadside. You can pull over and park. And these are from like the 30s and 40s, 1930s, 1940s, so fairly recent. But the idea is you could take seashells and if you heated them up hot enough, you would, could make cement. And the way that works is that by heating limestone, which is made of the mineral calcite, calcium carbonate, you basically force the CO2 out of it as a gas. And you leave behind calcium oxide, which is the cement. So when you mix dry calcium oxide with water, that's what then forms the binding agent in cement. And to give you an idea of how much cement we make, of roughly seven or eight percent of the total amount of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere as humans comes from the making of cement, not from burning fossil fuels, but from making cement, which is quite amazing. So there are a number of sites along the West Coast that are limestone quarries, where they quarry the limestone, bake it to make cement, and then of course sell that for making uh, human built structures. Okay, and we still have time for a few more questions, although we're starting to run out of time. Uh, I think you've smashed the barriers between cultural guiding and uh, nature guiding already. The adventure part I'm not finding here completely yet, uh, but I suppose we could always touch on uh, environmentalism and politics. Uh, it says, yeah, what would the proposed car power ship energy shipyard do to this unique ecosystem? No. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know about that specifically, but what I am aware of um, is that there are a number of efforts, both at um, you know local municipal level and also more at the Western Cape region, regional level, of trying, because remember I said one of the key things is so many animals and plants we've already lost to extinction. Fortunately, they went locally extinct here, but were available elsewhere. We started to repopulate them here. But the key thing is to conserve what still remains as best we can. And one of the programs of doing that is creating, obviously, nature reserves, national parks. And then the critical thing there is to try to connect them through what are often called conservation corridors. And what those are, are strips of land that are trying to be kept as undeveloped as possible 
to allow for plants and animals to be able to move around and, and um, go where they need to go and to survive. And a very good example of an unintentional conservation corridor are roads, right? So you, if you drive up the West Coast and you look out the window, you see the farmer's fence and you see the verge. And the verge, you'll see an amazing diversity of plants. And beyond that on the fence, you'll see sort of very little. So that's the effect of grazing, that's the effect of farming. And those roadside verges represent relatively preserved uh, plant communities. Now, of course, for animals that live in those communities, it's, it's, a, it's a risky business because every time they cross the road, they get run over. Uh, so it's not ideal. But that's the concept is to try to provide roads without cars, of uh, strips of land that connect reserves. So the Blauberg Conservation Area is an example. The um, Cedarburg Corridor that links uh, St. Helena Bay to the, to the escarpment in the, in the east, that's another example. So there's a number of them efforts to try to get land conserved and then linked so that we can give these poor plants and animals a fighting chance to hopefully hold on. Okay, uh, you've mentioned the verges and uh, you've said that uh, it's an example of the conserved vegetation. There could be a counter argument to that and say that it's probably because of the disturbance initially that uh, pioneer species have evolved faster and have colonized these verges. But uh, I think that's the topic for another day. The, yeah. the question that I find here, which is interesting, is because you've already answered the one on the kilns, somebody asked about kaolin. Is there an overlap between kaolin mining and the kilns as well? Not really. Kaolinite is, was mined from mainly uh, the Sun Valley, uh, which is... Uh, on the that, other side. Yeah, so that, that's, you know, between Nordhook and Fishhook you have a major geological fault that runs through that, that defines Sun Valley. And that fault acted as a conduit for water to get into the earth, deep into the earth. And it allowed for the granite there, the basement rock of the granite, to be chemically altered through the water. And what that did was it transformed the crystalline feldspar in the granite into kale and clay. And it leached it very deeply such that they could mine out the weathered granite to extract the kill and clay, which many of us know from continental China, right? You go to a restaurant or you have a cup of tea, <clears throat> those white China cups and the plates and everything. If you look underneath continental China, probably a lot of that is from the kale and that came out of the Sun Valley mines. Now they have since uh, closed those mines because they uh, got out of them what they could and now they've been turned into housing developments and things like that. But yeah, uh, kaolin is very different and you really just have to extract it from the weathered, deeply weathered bedrock. And then you can fire it into uh, China. So, so it, requires heat. Made, uh... it requires heat to make, but it's not the same as limestone. Okay, and it doesn't really have a major influence around Ace of Fortein. No, no, to my knowledge, there's no kaolin around Ace of Fortein because you need deeply weathered pockets of granite. There's certainly plenty of granite around Ace of Fortein, but I'm not aware of any deeply weathered pockets that have been mined for kaolin. Um, okay. The ones I'm familiar with are in the, on the Cape Peninsula. Right, then... There are questions about extinct animals again, uh, but this is a different question. This is actually quite an interesting one. Any weird species that existed that are no longer there, but that we would now associate with other continents, such as tigers or wolves or bears? Well, I think the standout example there would be the bear, right? Because, I mean, <laughs> uh, if you're from the Northern Hemisphere, you're very familiar with bears. Uh, there's a lot of them. And it always amazed me coming to Africa. It's the one big animal you don't see here. And 
to think that this is the only spot ever on the whole African continent that they've ever found a bear is amazing. So it indicates that bears did once live in Africa as recently as five million years ago, um, and that they you know, no longer live here. Um, the other thing that's of course migrated down from Eurasia are the goats, sheep, cattle, right? So when the pastoralist moved in, so originally in Southern Africa, we had the hunter gatherers. They gathered roots and other plant material and they killed uh, antelope, you know, dossies and so forth to survive. And then about 2000 years ago, uh, having come originally from North Africa through the East African uh, zone, the pastoralists arrived from Southern Africa and they brought with them sheep and then goats and cattle. So those came from the Northern, they didn't live here before. So those were unique species that had evolved in Eurasia and of course were domesticated and raised you know, for food and milk. And they were then brought to Southern Africa around 2000 years ago. And then you had this interesting dynamic between a community of pastoralists who raised cattle or sheep, and then the indigenous people who were the San, the Bushmen, who were living here as hunter-gatherers. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting history of that. Okay, well then, uh, I think we almost at the end, uh, we're busy setting up uh, Professor Harris's uh, presentation. So I think I'll look for one more question and the rest of the questions that have been posed will be answered offline uh, at some later stage and posted on the website. So let's see. There's a question here from uh, Jonathan, which says, where can one find rock art of the sand and an example of the clay toys found along the coastline? The, um, there's a many uh, rock art sites in the Cedarburg Mountains. So um, it shouldn't be difficult to find resources for that. Certainly the ones that like I find spectacular would be the uh, Sevilla Rock Art Trail in Traveler's Rest, which is um, across the Paques Pass away from Clan William. So the Clan William area and the Cedarburg in there has beautiful rock art. The photo I showed you of those elephants comes from Stadstall, which is a um, publicly accessible site that you can get to in the Cedarburg. Uh, it's not too far from Citrusdal, sort of on the way between Citrusdal and Ceres. Um, so there, there are many, many spectacular rock art sites in the Western Cape within the Cedarburg Mountains. Um, and they shouldn't be difficult if you, if you Google it, uh, you shouldn't have trouble finding many examples of places where you can go. And many, many farmers know where they have rock art on their farms and are happy to show it to people who visit things like that. So that, that's quite, quite easily seen. I'm not quite sure about the last part of the question about the clay part, but the rock art is, is abundant and wonderful to see. Yeah, I think the main threat uh, in this case is that if it becomes too accessible, you get the, the weirdos with the cans of spray paint and the other things. But then on the other hand, it must also be accessible. So yeah. you and mentioned funnels. Yeah, that's where guides them. come in. You know, guides know the rules. Guides can help the group to, you know, so most of these sites um, you have to, well, I suppose they could be abused, you're right. But uh, fortunately, not many of them are, at least the ones I've been to. And of course, with guides, um, that would be a good reason to have guides along to keep, keep mm -hmm. people from wanting to leave their <laughs> initials or whatever, you know. Yeah, I think the main, the main thing is it has to be done in a controlled situation as one of the comments that just came through also notes. Um, okay, I think uh, we should be ready for Prof. Harris now. Uh, I'm just waiting for confirmation. 
and I don't see confirmation that we're ready for her yet. Let's just have a look. Ah, Prof. Harris is online. Okay, so I think I'm going to thank you very much now, Professor, for the wonderful presentation you've done. You've really made me happy to be able to facilitate this. And uh, now I have uh, to introduce Prof. Harris. Uh, she's from the University of Pretoria. And uh, the emphasis of her presentation is still a bit of a mystery to me because I don't know if it's about history or the present. So I don't know if it's a cultural adventure in time travel. I think we're all going to find this out together. All right, thank you, Professor. Uh, Prof. Harris, I think you're muted. I don't hear you. Sorry, here we go. Is that better? Yep, volume. 100%. Right. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, um, Francois. The last time you and I met, if you recall, was just prior to lockdown um, in 2020. It's the International Tourist Guides Day up in Johannesburg. And um, we were talking about domestic tourism and looking into our own backyard. And well, did we not know that this was going to become a reality? And here it is. So you're absolutely well, right. Yes. You were, we were told that uh, the tourist guiding profession was going to be the first one to be eliminated by a presenter from the Department of Science and Technology. And we said, no, we're gonna prove you wrong. So everybody that's listening to this uh, presentation today, remember, we're gonna prove them wrong. Absolutely, Francois, absolutely. Right, thank you for that. Um, just to check, you, you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Excellent. I'm going to mute myself and disappear now. Okay, right. Well, as Francois asked, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a pleasure to be here and I want to thank you, Vishnu Pillay, for the invitation and, of course, for my, my very close relationship with the Department um, of Tourism um, and the University of Victoria, which is, is now in the excess of 10 years where we do research and collaborate. Um, I'm not going to take you down the route um, of a, a historical lesson, but rather I'm going to talk about the importance of history in the tourism domain and talk about, you know, tourist guides, um, as we know them, and I just need to get the screen to move. Right, so the topic that I've chosen for today is touring with history. Um, and as Professor Compton said, you use, you know, you look at the past through the present. And I'm going to be making a case for history. Um, and as I indicated in the little brief overview, we're going to be looking at the legal dimension, but then also at um, history per se. So my paper is basically broken into two parts. It'll be looking at the legal very briefly, just to, to give us where we're at, and then moving on to the practical component and the relationship between history and tourism, looking at content and then looking at the skills. Now, this is one of my favorite um, images that I, I put together some years back, putting the tourist guide at the epicenter of the tourist industry. And I think that is something that is critically important and that needs to be emphasized at, in every domain across government through the public and private sector. Without the tourist guide, tourism doesn't function. Um, and Francois gave us a very brief introduction into the role of the tour tourist guide. You've got to be personally strong, you've got to have knowledge, and then you've got to be well prepared. But for me, the tourist guide is a lot more. The tourist guide really fulfills all these many roles. And if you just cast, cast your eye over that, I'm sure many of you will feel, yes, I do that. That's part of me. That's where I'm at. Um, and so with the tourist guide having this multi-layered um, role to play in the industry, they should, as I say, be elevated and acknowledged for this role. The tourist guide I regard as the crucial link between the tourist and the attraction. It is the tourist guide, after all, who determines the experience. If people return, it's because of that tourist guide experience. And the tourist guide presents what I like to call a structured performance. The knowledge base is critical. You cannot go out there unless you have your product. And your product is not the destination. It's the knowledge about the destination and beyond the destination. Now, tourist guiding, um, as we know from the World Federation of Tourist Guides and many other international organizations, it falls into two very distinct groupings. They are either regulated or they're unregulated. And in South Africa, we are very regulated. 
Um, it, it, it's very interesting. One of my colleagues has done research on this. He actually did a study, his master's on, on India, where we see how regulated the industry is. And in the global south, this appears to be the issue. You look at India, you look at China, you look at South Africa, very regulated. When we look elsewhere into the global north, we'll find that the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States of America, you want to guide, you guide. Um, no big deal at all. This is just a list, and I promise you I'm not going to take you through all of them, but just to show you how far back the regulation of the tourism sector goes in our country, way back to 1927, when tourism was sort of part of South African harbors and railways. And if you go to some of the older hotels in Southern Africa, particularly in Zimbabwe, you will find that they still have these large posters framed up in some of the hotels showing the South African harbors and railways being involved in travel. And of course, your main mechanism at that point was the rail line. We won't go into that now. However, from the 1930s, we start getting legislation that looks at the tourism sector itself. And in fact, in 1978, there was a Tourist Guides Act, an act specifically developed for us. And I still think this act stands the test of time. And we've actually made recommendations from our department and research that we've done that some of the things should be looked back at again. We know that we now have the 2014 Tourism Act, which is, is under um, discussion and is, is, is going through a um, revision. Um, but what is important for me to point out from all of that legislation is that when they talk about you guys, and notice also you were talked about as tour guides way back then. Now, it, from 1993, you're referred to as a tourist guide. I remember former colleagues saying to me, if you talk about a tour guide, that is a book. A tourist guide is the person. That's who you are. What I've highlighted from these three acts is to show you that you are the people who get monetary compensation, some kind of reward for accompanying people who travel or visit a country and you give them information or comments. Now, I find that very funny, your information or comments. It's a hang of a lot more than that. Um, but it's interesting to see that that is reiterated in all the legislation. The Tourism Act um, of 1993 is of interest to me because it says that no person should be registered as a tourist guide unless he shows he has the requisite, and note it is a he, but we'll forgive them for that, it was 1993, shows the requisite knowledge of the matters specified in a particular subsection. And when I teach this, um, way back when I started teaching tourism at the University of Pretoria, I used to make my students read this out loud. The knowledge com contemplated in subsection four shall relate to, and there it is, history. History was listed first up. And to me, this is absolutely critical. In fact, at the University of Pretoria, where the students do the Heritage and Cultural Tourism degree, they are compelled to take history in their first year. It is a not an elective, but a compulsory core module. And then there are, of course, the other subjects, geography, fauna, flora, climate, availability of medical emergent services, background on culture of different peoples, infrastructure of the tourism industry, and of course, the economic circumstances and um, the geographical area that you are in question. Now, moving to the academic world, one of the um, greats in tourism research way back into the 70s was Jafar Jafari, who's written a hang of a lot about it. And he had the spidergram. And I remember when I first came across this, I was like, what? There's no history on the spidergram. Subjects like geography, economics, sociology, psychology, and go on, we listed. But history was not on the spidergram of what was important for tourism studies. And to me, I think this is a, a major error, a major fault. He does, however, further on in his article, say that history is a specialized area of study. And he says also that it could be useful if it's brought to bear in achieving an understanding of tourism. I beg to disagree. Even going further down south, we have this book by Nick Manning, the essential training manual for tour managers and tour guides. Note he still refers to tour guides. Um, and I must say, South Africa is ahead of the game and our tourist guides are ahead of the game in this international comparative work that we've done over the years. Manning doesn't use the word history in his book. He subtitles references to anything as political. So there's almost as if there's an analogy for the subject. And this is something I feel needs to be addressed. Fortunately, travel writer Paul Rose made the point that every trip has a historical dimension. And the wonderful presentation by um, Professor Compton, I think every second or third slide, he was using the word history, he was referring to the past, so it is absolutely indispensable to what we do. So every trip has a historical dimension. We, as historians, tell stories. I am a trained historian. My specialization was a doctorate in history. 
Um, but as tourist guides, we also tell stories. I'm also an accredited tourist guide, a culture guide. And it's not only his story, just by the way, just a little bit of a nudge to the legislation there. It's her story. It's everybody's story. And this is an image that, that sort of portrays what we do. We talk and we tell about the past because it has been a fascination since time immemorial that what we do as humans is we tell stories. This is what we're all about, is telling stories is what makes us actually human. If we go back to the ancients, we know that there are records of the storytelling in whatever culture and nationality you can think of. And if we think of society today, people sit around and tell stories. It's not only children who are read stories, we tell stories wherever we are. And that is after all, what makes the profession that you guys are in so very, very important and so very exciting. Now, going back on a historical note, we know that the modern tourism dates back to the Grand Tour. And basically this was a very elitist uh, process, something that I think has transformed dramatically and something that I think in the new dispensation will have to change even more. But when the Grand Tour started out way back then, it was the history of the classical and Renaissance world. And it was young gentlemen from places like the United Kingdom who were taken across Europe and shown the, the great arts, architecture and music. And this was where the tourism got off the ground. The idea was that a um, tourist guide would go and explain the background, would present the context, would give the narrative of the particular place that you're in. They would talk about the change that had taken place and also the understanding of the present. And I think as you're looking at those different subtitles, you're probably thinking, well, yeah, I got that. That's what I do. Well, that is what tourist guides do. The product needs to be unpacked. The product does not speak for itself. And that is why the tourist guide enhances the experience. Now, if we look at layers of history, and I think, again, Prof Compton made some references and you had some diagrams that look very much like the one that's on the left of my screen, where archaeologists, paleontologists go back in time and we dig back down to find what, uh, what has happened. But even in the present, as we stand in the present, we can also look to the past and make that experience that, that much more real. One of the things I always say to my history students is, the minute you walk through this door, what happened outside the door when they walk into my lecture hall is part of history. And that history makes you who you are. And if we look at above the ground, if I, if I can put it that way, in other words, we're not digging down into the paleontological and archeological world, but we can look at the layers that are with us now. And if in just very briefly, if we think about South African history, we go back to the early hominids, something also Prof Crompton mentioned, we have our first peoples, the San, some of them who are still in our country with us, the Khoikhoi, who were for the most part, unfortunately, um, died out probably at the turn of the, the 18th century, um, when we had the terrible smallpox event. Um, we're not the first people enduring a pandemic, let me just might add that. We have our Bantu speakers, who are the ancestors of the majority of our population. We have the Chinese possibly coming around the um, bottom end of Africa, and this is my own field of specialization, that you can actually do our whole history by looking through the lens of the Chinese. And they would speak that Chen Ho came down the southern coast, south, southern coast of Africa uh, way before the Portuguese had got their little dodgy ships to come around um, from, from the West. We then have early European travelers who come into this part of the world. We have the Portuguese, the Dutch, we have enslaved people who add another dimension, the British, and so it goes on. We now have people coming in from Africa, um, and, and so on and so forth. So there are many layers to our history, and that is something that we need to keep in mind when we are doing our tourist guiding. Now, this is a very brief um, timeline, giving an indication that our history goes way back. Um, and every destination and every place and every site that we visit is layered with this historical past. And it enriches the experience. And I think it's something that whenever I have gone on a, on a tour, which is not very really seldom, um, overseas. It is that person that has unpacked that past and made me feel part of what has happened there. Um, I remember taking a bunch of American students who I was teaching a history course on out to Moraping, and we stood out at the back then, although we'd done all this hominid and we'd looked at all the um, Homo erectus and Homo habilis and the whole lot, Australopithecus and everything, I told them all to be quiet. And I said to them, listen. And we were standing at the back when you overlook the hills at the back of the Moraping Museum, a little bit away. And I said to them, Let's listen to the quietness. Let's listen and imagine what this place looked like when it was way back then. And I actually then said to them, 
what would you do if Homo erectus suddenly came out of the bushes and they were like, yeah, whatever. But you need to create that experience. So coming back to the South African timeline, what I've got here for you is obviously the various phases of our history. And these are when major things occurred. They're kind of milestones. But there are many layers of history below this that make and, and contribute to this, this um, timeline that I'm referring to. And as you can see, our history goes way back. And as people, paleontologists and archaeologists are, are continuing with their research, we find that they're pushing that barrier back further and further. And we are the cradle of humankind. Now, I want to pause, for example, at our iconic Robben Island, just, just to unpack this a little bit more in a practical sense. We all talk about Robben Island, maximum security prison. This is where Mandela was held up. And you might have a tourist guide who will talk a little bit about it having been a museum, a national monument, and then becoming a World Heritage Site. However, we must know that this island was first looked upon by the original first peoples of this country. First of all, your San hunter-gatherers, who probably didn't go to the island. We have no evidence as, at this point, and we will continue looking for this, this evidence, but looked on this island from the, 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 the beaches of Cape Town. And then when your, your herders moved down, your pastures people, your koiku had engaged with people in the interior and they transformed into a pastoral lifestyle, they would also, as strandlopers, have gazed upon this landscape. Then it became an early stopping place for European ships. We have Dutch and the British using it then as a penal colony. In other words, it was a good island. And so way back in the 1700s, already this island had been used to put people who were um, not wanted in society um, and held um, there in sort of prison because there's not much of a way you're going to get back from there. In 1864, we have a lighthouse. I have a student who's just completed a wonderful thesis on um, ferology, which is the history of lighthouses. And she has gone through all the lighthouses across the coast um, of our country, right from the um, furthest northern part of KZN all the way around to the Northern Cape. But to think that there was a lighthouse out on Robben Island in 1864 is also a fascinating consideration. In the 1940s, with World War II breaking up, Robben Island was regarded as an excellent place for strategies. And so if you have your militarists as your guests um, and tourists, they will be interested in that. From the 1960s to 1990s, I call it the dark ages, it became a maximum security prison. And incredible stories have come and put Cape Town on the map for the incarceration of our first democratic president, as we all know. From 1991 to 1996, after the release of most of the ANC prisoners on the island, it became what was known as a medium security prison. Then in 1997, it became, as I said, a museum and a national monument. And then 1999, a World Heritage Site, and is still a great record in Cape Town. So what I've tried to depict in this slide is to show you the layers. There is a lot more than meets the eye. And we do need to stand in the present and look to the past and take, as I said, history on tour. This is a beautiful image, and this is for real. It's very chocolate boxy, but it is from my campus, the University of Pretoria. Um, one of our um, um, avenues, we have a, what we call a pedestrian campus. So the students um, don't have cars flashing around um, all over the place. These are walkways. And of course, this time of the year is when our beautiful jacarandas come to being. And at the university, we our final our honor students rather run a agency called UP Campus Tours, where they start to um, develop their skills on guiding with real life experiences, taking students, prospective students, guests, ambassadors, you name it, they do it on campus on these tours. Um, and so they need to obviously understand. But again, when you're doing this, there are again many layers. We know that possibly right when this world of ours, the Southern African area, because it had no borders, no lines, no demarcations. The San people who migrated through Southern Africa might have come in this area. Um, and we do have um, evidence of early Bantu speaking people in the area, particularly the Suchitswana. We know that early Europeans moved in this area. And I'm talking about the very area where the university stands. We know that the Fuhr trekkers who moved into the country from the 1830s might have crossed our, our campus at some point. And then, of course, the first jacaranda tree that was planted in Pretoria in 1888. And there's a story about that, one of those kind of fun facts that he thought he was planting a different kind of a tree, and then it turned out to be the jacaranda. Uh, he had imported saplings from Brazil, and of course, our um, Pretoria is known as the jacaranda city. Just by the way, Johannesburg has more jacarandas than us, but we'll, we'll go with the name. Um, these plants that are indigenous to Central and South America are also now on the um, forbidden list. 
but they have become part of Pretoria's culture. And at the University of Pretoria, you will see on the two top pictures, there's a little um, myth that goes around that students believe if a jacaranda flower falls on their heads during exam time, they will definitely pass their exam. Another shot from our beautiful campus is what I call the Fever Tree um, Avenue. As some of you will know this tree, it's indigenous to South Africa. It is really a beautiful tree. The same applies, it is native to Southern Africa. And so many of our neighboring countries have this tree as well. What is interesting and what people don't usually know is that this tree actually has a um, history prior to the Boers getting it wrong. It was used by African tribes many, many years ago as a divination tool. You would take the bark and mix it with a number of other herbs, boil it up into a brew, and then it would elucidate what uh, induce rather hallucinations of white paths. And so before you went to sleep, you would ask a question. And after drinking the brew, you would get an answer to the question. And that would be um, how you would resolve your problem. The actual name, Bachella Xanthoclea, was um, named after George Harvey Bachel, who lived from 1789 and 1839, and he was a chaplain to the British East India Company in Macau, just off Hong Kong shores, and he collected plants in China, and so the name was given to him. The second part of the species name is derived from the Greek word xanthos, yellow, and phleos, bark. As you know, the bark peels away, as you can see in the bottom image. Now, the early pioneers, and I think you all know the story, thought that this tree caused a fever because when people traveled into the interior and lived near the area, they often got a very bad fever. What they actually had was malaria. And it was incorrectly believed that the tree gave them the malaria. But it was not that. The tree grows in a swampy area. The swampy area is where mosquitoes breed. And so they would be being infected by the mosquitoes and not by the fever tree. So the fever tree name is a total misnomer. And then, of course, Rudyard Kipling in his wonderful series, Just So Stories, has also um, captured the whole um, story of the fever tree because he talks about the fever tree, the great green greasy limpopo all set about with fever trees. And these are the kinds of things you pack in when you're doing your layered stories. This is an iconic draw card in um, Soweto. You all know this, the Hector Peterson Memorial. And of course, we all have to relay the tragic story of what happened in the 1976 riots. But again, I would argue that one can unpack this in layers. Early hominids, not far away, we know they were living in Maripin, could have moved through this area at the time. The first peoples, there's a good chance that they might've been in the area, not settling for longer periods, um, at all, but we do know that the sound moved up from the southwestern Cape into the interior of southern Africa, and various um, paleontologists and archaeologists have different theories about how they eventually encountered people with cattle, and as Prof. Crompton mentioned, they then acquired this herding system and moved them back into southern Africa. Good chances they did cross our territories that we have. Um, the Bantu-speaking peoples, we definitely know outside of Johannesburg, on the outskirts, you'll find remains of iron smelting, so going back beyond this place. The early travelers that might have crisscrossed over this area, the 1850s, um, the poor trekkers were definitely establishing the ZAR Republic in rebellion to the British and getting away from the British um, rule in the, in the Cape. Then, of course, the milestone stage of 1886, Igoli, um, when gold was discovered on the Bidbatis Rond and Johannesburg becomes the city of gold. And then, dining down 90 years later, we have um, the Hector Peterson um, incident where this young boy is tragically killed and students gather to protest the imposition um, and the treatment that they're receiving in schools. And schooling remains a problem in our country, as we know. Hashtag fees must fall is very much in our memories still. Interestingly, the Peterson family was originally the Pizzo family, but they decided to adopt the Peterson name to try to pass as colored as they were believed to have enjoyed somewhat better privileges under apartheid than black people did. So that is also an interesting fact, bringing in a contested history of apartheid and how people were compartmentalized and boxed into various groupings and treated very differently. Here, the magnificent building again, and I won't go into the details of our union buildings, gives you again how we can take the story back um, and then unpack. Something I just want to mention here, we all talk about the 1956 20,000 women protesting against apartheid, and we actually have a public holiday to celebrate that event. And many people forget that in 1915, Afrikaner woman barged onto the um, union building ground, it only being three years old at that stage, asking that the prisoners, their husbands, many of them, who had been put into jail for rebelling against the participation in the First World War, should please be pardoned. 
So it is a site of many protests. And as you know as well, we have at the moment still some protesting um, from the Khoi Khoi people demanding a better deal in the country. Now, moving on to the next part of my paper, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, this is basically based on an article that I wrote in the Journal of Tourism History. Fascinating journal, and I would encourage you to actually visit it online. The paper that I wrote was called Taking History on Tour, Lowering the Disciplinary Drawbridge. And it was actually written to make my colleagues who are historians and purists understand that there's an incredible link between history and tourism. And there have been many professors in the past, some of them passed on, who have grumbled about the tourism domain, the glossing over of history, this touristic history that is portrayed. And this article was basically um, written to emphasize that there is a very, very special and important link between history and tourism. And that is why today I'm very proud to say our department at the University of Pretoria is the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies, um, encompassing both tourism and um, uh, history. So the point I make in this article is basically the skills and methodologies inherent to the historical profession are in many ways germane to the professional tourist guide. Um, and you know it reflects on a very close symbiosis between history and tourism. And I'm almost feeling that again, we need to go back to that legislation where tourist guides need to be historians. I'm going to run through some of these parallels just to make my point. Doing research is what a historian does. We gather evidence, we evaluate, and then we take this evidence from primary sources, whether they be archival documents or interviews. We then integrate it with um, secondary works and we co corroborate and critically assess what we have. History is a dynamic subject. So when people are talking about the rewriting of history, that is what we do. We have to keep on asking new questions, new evidence, and looking at it through new perspectives. History is not the past, it is about the past. If we look at tourism, tourist guides also collect information about destination sites and events. They research these mostly from secondary sources, often produced by historians. Now, historians are charged, and it's one of the most critical skills we try to impart upon our young historians or budding historians, as I call them, to read critically to think critically. Just because it's in print or just because it's online doesn't mean it's 100% correct. You need to detect bias and you need to interpret and construct a substantiated account of what's happening. And the same applies to tourist guides. We need to have this, this the issue of being critical in what we present and how we present it. And remembering also that the audience that um, tourist guides have is far more demanding than what we have as historians. We have captive students in a, in a venue or we have an academic book. You have this vibrant demanding group of people that you have to not only inform, but also entertain. The research needs to be written in a logical and comprehensible um, way by historians um, in the context of a given time period for a particular reading audience. And again, it must be a substantiated written account. That is why we have footnotes to justify where we've got our information and what our evidence is based on. Information that is imparted by a tourist guide is also packaged in a logical manner, um, but in an oral presentation, obviously. It has to be balanced. It has to be intelligible. It has to be unbiased and interesting, if not even intriguing. So I always talk about tourism being educational entertainment or entertaining education, it's up to you. But at the end of the day, it's information that it's got to have a spin. Now, one of our greats in history, John Tosh, um, wrote a really phenomenal book, The Pursuit, Pursuit of History, and I think it's probably in its about its 12th edition. That is how it stood the test of time. And when he was talking about the historian, he said narrative, is the historian's basic technique for conveying what it felt like to observe or participate in past events. You want to take your person back to that time, to the context. You cannot stand today in judgment of what happened way back then. Look at it within its contextual time. And in essence, this is what a tourist guide's doing, a narrator and a storyteller who is doing exactly the same. Historians strive to create in their readers the illusion of direct experience by evoking an atmosphere or setting a scene. And that is exactly what you do as a tourist guide. You have to evoke an almost tangible experience of the place or the event to your tourist public. And this we've been having to do also online, which is very challenging, but it can be done. And again, my, my honor students who run UP campus tours as an agency on the campus have been doing this for the past two years where they've gone online, but made an interactive real experience. Um, history is a thoroughly interpretive discipline. And you as the tourist guide 
are seen as an interpreter, a go-between, a mediator between the tourist, your guest, and that destination that you are sharing with them. So in order for us to avoid distortion, bias, and what has been criticized um, by academia and particularly by historians um, about the tourist gloss or a gloss over of history, tourist guides need to be trained. They need to be passionate. They need to love um, history and they need to know the skills that are at the heart of the discipline of history. In sum, the tourist guide can only benefit from exposure to the methodologies and skill sets um, inherit to the discipline of history. I want to pause now at the latest, um, well, it's not so much the latest because as we know, this already appeared in 2018. The Department of Higher Education indicated and basic education that in 2018, that history would become a compulsory school subject. And again, this has re-emerged this very week, um, coincidentally, that a new history curriculum would be on the cards for South African schools. And as it would happen, our department and I personally was contacted, what was my feeling? Now, you would think as a historian and as, as somebody in the, in, in the discipline, I would say, yes, this is the best thing out. We need to have history as a compulsory subject. Well, actually, it's not. Um, I don't want history to become the next life orientation. I don't want people doing the subject who don't have a passion for it. And I don't want teachers who don't want to teach it, teaching it. If the government does put in all the way with all to make this the subject that it should be and to be taught the way that it should be, I think we've got a good chance indeed. The understanding of history in a Southern African context is regarded as a means to obviate against ignorance and concomitant xenophobia. Um, at the time when we had so many of uh, the xenophobic air outbreaks um, earlier in, in um, the century, 2008 comes to mind and subsequently after that, Rob Seaborger from the University of Cape Town wrote a very, very good article where he said, if people understood their history, we would not be having these xenophobic attacks. People would understand where, this, where we come from and how many of the people who are now seen as being from neighboring countries were actually part and parcel of this country. It was the colonists who drew the lines. And so an ignorance of where we come from and what we've been through and what people have endured is part of the problem. Another issue that is very important in the South African context is the question of perspective. Um, and it, that needs to be brought into the equation, particularly when dealing with contested past or sensitive cultural issues, which you as tourist guides deal with on a daily basis. At one level, I've also argued that, that tourism is in fact public history. Um, so tourism, which can be seen to share or open up the histories of different cultures and societies to others, is also heralded as a peace broker. And this is very, very important. And you're probably all aware, there's actually an institute um, for peace through tourism, which was established in 1986 to foster and facilitate this very thing. And again, I think that the government and that society at large needs to accredit the tourist guide with the incredibly important role that they can play. Tourism initiatives contribute to international understanding and cooperation. You unlock the experience of the other, you unlock the culture, and you present a understanding in a most accessible and also hopefully uh, enjoyable and entertaining manner. Um, Professor uh, Compton referred to the whole idea of having tourist guides to protect our incredible paleontological history. And that is so important. We cannot have people going out and seeing these treasures if tourist guides are not there. It needs to be mandated by sand parks, by the Department of Environmental, that if you do want to see these things, you need a qualified tourist guide to include, improve the quality of our environment, the preservation of our heritage, and, and, and bring about a more peaceful and sustainable world. And I do believe that the tourist guide is a mechanism for this. The European Union's tourism also endorses. The tourist guide's role goes far beyond guiding and information provision. Yes, that is part of your role, but it goes to the human element that enables us to build bridges between different cultures visiting the region. And we're actually embarking on a project at the moment, looking at the post-COVID situation, remodeling tourism with the Department of um, National Department of Tourism. And again, as everybody has across the globe, looking to our domestic market. And as I mentioned, um, at the beginning to Francois, in my presentation in March 2019, I said we must not ignore our own backyard, our own people. We need to get a travel culture going. And perhaps COVID has given us that opportunity. And we are doing research, as I said, to bring this to the fore. So ladies and gentlemen, 
One of the oldest disciplines, and in fact, almost the oldest, is history, can offer a more robust product in terms of both content and the skills. It's not only about the facts that you're going to give across, but it's that interpretation and that way that you express this information that is so important. And so I strongly believe that there should be a um, very definite um, link between history and what is now one of the fastest growing sectors, tourism. And so with that, keep the South African Tourist Guide flag flying. We have a lot to offer and we must become the best that we can. On closing, I would just like to thank all my colleagues in the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies. These are postgraduates who have worked on various uh, projects that I've done, as I said, way back um, into 2011, I think was when we began, Richard Wiley and myself started out there, but subsequently many of the students have worked hard and have contributed to some of the work that I've presented for you today. On that note, I thank you and over to you. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Prof. Harris. It's always a pleasure listening to you and speaking with you. Um, there's a lot of questions that have been posed. Um, I think I've summarized it a little bit, but basically the focus on your, of your presentation was on history, as you said it was going to be, and it wasn't really time travel, which is what I wanted to find out whether it was or not. <laughs> But uh, there are a couple of points uh, that I'd, I'd like to make before I start looking at the questions. And one of those is uh, the referral to the history gloss, where you said the tourist guides need to be passionate. And I think we both agree on that. Uh, lots of questions have been asked about things like the paleontology and culinary tourism. And the point I'd like to make is that your focus is on history. Uh, my focus is more on natural science because that's my background. But at the end of the day, the research is what matters. So whether you're researching the historical perspective or whether you're researching it from a different point of view, um, the tourist guide needs to be an all-rounder. Um, in South Africa, we unfortunately have a situation where we are split into three categories. And a lot of guides believe that because they're a nature guide, they don't need to know about history or because they're an adventure guide, they don't need to know so much about nature or about history because why do you need to know about that for abseiling? But the, the, the reality of the matter is that you need to know about the history. Uh, it affects things like uh, culinary tourism because the spices came from somewhere, the cooking methods came from somewhere else. Um, and we need to actually be an all-rounder. History forms part of that. Uh, when I have clients from Brazil, I need to know where they come from. So I mentioned things like the Dutch West India Company and Pernambuco, and then they understand immediately what the Dutch East India Company is about, and it puts them in the same time frame. Um, so you need to know history, but the focus need not be so much on history, but on overall, I think. That's my point of view. So getting to the questions, there was one about the Chinese um, and the can, can, street. Fran Francois, can I, mm. sorry, can I just answer you quickly um, before we move yeah. on? Um, I think we do have time. I do agree with you about it all rounder, but it doesn't oh, matter got time. if you are a scientist, you still, you heard Professor Compton. He used the word history virtually on every, if, mm. if not every second slide. So whether you are a scientist or whether you're whatever, you need to understand the history. You need to know that your science has changed as well. It has a history. Everything yes, has yes. a history. You cannot get away from that. And if you do not put that perspective on the board, you've got a problem. The question of dividing us into adventure guides, nature guides, culture guides um, is an interesting one. And I actually had it as part of the slide, but then I thought, let me just take that off because that's another story for another day. But I've been asked to talk to people at Dirty Boots, for example, which is an adventure. You cannot even take somebody on a bungee jump if you do not, if you cannot explain that environment. Um, those people who are going on now the longest, what is it, slide over Mossel Bay, you know, across the ocean. When you climb up there, you overlook those incredible caves. You have people sitting there waiting for their turn to go on this wowie down for two minutes or whatever it is. But when you are there, you people talk about that environment. I, I went on the thing and I ended up doing a sort of an informal discussion of we're going on this foofy slide or whatever you want to call it, but we need to know about this place. You're going to go by flying past these caves which were inhabited by some of the first peoples. Mossel Bay is becoming a really hot paleontological destination. So absolutely, everything, all three of our divisions, nature, culture, and adventure are definitely 
um, able to link to the history. And the all round, as you say, is very important. You, you mentioned something about the culinary. I've just had a student who did a master's, a history student, on milk tot, the history of the milk tot. Now, you might think, well, what the hang, you know, have I lost the plot? No. And she's taken this milk tot right back to mid, the, the, the Middle Ages and how it eventually comes here. I've got another student who's now working on the cook sister with the K and the coo sister without the K and how this emerges. The, just a culinary delight that you're going to maybe share with your, with your guests. It's got a history. And I think that's important. But it's not only about the content. It is about those skills, which are absolutely, you know, to me, you cannot be in this game if you do not, you know, if you're not able to utilize the skills which are so germane to the history profession. But sorry, over to you. No, no, that's perfect. That that's basically what I wanted you to say because, uh, as I said, the, the the history is the glue, but all the other elements have to be in there, and we can't actually compartmentalize guides into three different mm -hmm. categories. There has to be a general overview that all guides do, which covers a little bit of each domain. And history obviously forms part of it. Uh, okay, but now the questions. Um, one that, that I have a gripe with, you mentioned Virgilia. <laughs> we all know where that comes from, but uh, I think a lot of the guides would expect you to say the old name. I want to hear it from you. What's the old name? <laughs> uh, you've got me in a spot now. Um, no, Acacia, come on. Acacia. Yeah, Acacia, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, I wanted to give the history again. So yeah, you're Acacia, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's part of the history. It, as far as I'm it concerned, is. historically, yeah. it wasn't Acacia. Absolutely, absolutely. But you yeah. know, this is what we do. That's why it's so dynamic. It's always changing. And that's why tourist guides have to be up to speed all the time. Okay, then uh, we had a question. Uh, let's see. about. You said the, something the about Chinese. Chinese. Yes, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. This is just up your street. Somebody mm -hmm. wanted much more information on the Chinese. Uh, I don't think we can answer it in detail, but they I also can give you a lecture. To know how west did they get? Um, how far west? Um, look, we know that from Chen Ho's records that we don't have because the Chinese Empire destroyed all those records. The Chinese came down the east coast of Africa at least a half century prior to the Portuguese um, circumnavigating the Cape. And we do know that they came down as far as possibly um, Mozambique Island. Um, the records that the Chinese being one of the nations in the world that has got the most wonderful historical record were destroyed because the emperor did not want any other Chinese to follow in these foolish steps of Chen Ho or Chen Hei, depending on your pronunciation. He was a eunuch and he, he did seven voyages that we're aware of. He came down the coast with what were known as floating um, cities. These were a hundred meter long vessels when, you know, the Portuguese were floating around in these little bobbing dinky toys that had um, canvas uh, sails and didn't last many um, uh, 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 journeys. But the Chinese had um, sails made out of bamboo. They could capture the monsoon winds and they would then, you know, um, manipulate these, these sails so that they could come to where they were. Um, the Chinese also did not colonize or settle at all. Although we've got some very interesting stories coming out, which, as I say, I could share it another day because the whole Chinese thing, and it's something we need to look at. If China continues to become one of the top um, host countries for, for tourists, um, obviously to connect with your Chinese tourists and what they do would be, would be fascinating. So we know that the first Chinese could have been here in those very, very early years. The various um, legends about, for example, the Basutu hat was influenced by the Chinese. We have the fact that the Khoi Khoi language has five um, uh, um, um, sounds which align with the Chinese. I have um, evidence that in Mozambique, the northern part of Mozambique, that there are actually people there that have Chinese features. Um, and so, you know, I can go on and on and on. But the Chinese definitely were in the Cape Colony from the very first years of the Dutch having set up their settlement there and have played a role in the history subsequently, as we know. Okay. But that's a whole thing on that, its own. <laughs> <laughs> it is a whole thing on its own, and that, that's what's important about it. Uh, it, it. It's all about the emphasis on the tour and the clients. I just noticed the comment here, which I, I was going to keep to myself, and then I thought I'd let you know what it said it, it, it said uh not good too much detail clients want to have fun they're on holiday so basically i understand what that person is saying from my point of view as a guide i interpret the group when i'm with the group absolutely uh, it's about having the people skills to know what your client wants and yes there are people that are party animals and don't actually want to know about anything mm -hmm. you have to give them the freedom 
at Absolutely. the same time, it's important to have the background so that you can cope and cater to the ones that want more. That's what um, makes the guiding so demanding, I think, Francois, is that you have to read your group. If you're having a group of, you know, grade four children, you're not going to be giving them the details, the date, and, the, and, and who was the architect of a building. You're rather going to tell them this building's got a fun fact. You can hear an echo in it or whatever the case may be. So obviously you adapt it. But it is important that you understand the depth and the context because when you're going to get those contentious questions from that more or um, elitist um, tour tourist, you're going to have to have the answer. Yes. yes. Uh, we've got a question here, which is uh, punting your business. It says, may you expand on what tourist guiding components are available in the heritage and cultural tourism degrees at the University of Pretoria under postgrad? Fabulous presentation. Uh, thank you very much. We have a, well, we've got it. You can actually do a doctorate in our department, um, as I say, um, and we do, you know, whatever anybody's interested in, as I mentioned, the ferology, um, which was the study of lighthouses. Lighthouse tourism is big in a number of countries across the world, Canada, Australia, Croatia, and so on. And we could make a big deal of it here in South Africa as well. Um, but in our, in our um, um, uh, degree, it is a three-year degree at undergraduate level and the, the Bachelor in Heritage and Cultural Studies. Students, um, are um, in, have to do a heritage and cultural tourism component. They also do one year, one one module of history with me in their first year, which is an overview of history of Southern Africa. Um, and then they take other subjects. They are exposed to a range of issues. Um, and if the individual would like, I can send them the little brochure that we have. We look at um, you know heritage. We look at protection. We look at um, the legislation. We look at um, risk management. We look at um, this you know disability. Obviously, the history of tourism, the legislation they do in third year, um, and they do a practical component where they actually do a bus tour um, and do the guiding itself. So it is both a hands-on and um, also the very theoretical. Community tourism is in there, all the different types of tourism, dark tourism, tanner tourism, culinary tourism, and so on and so forth. At the honours level, um, the one module that I present, we um, do... Um, events tourism, but we also have then, as I say, this practical component, which comprises 50% of the students' final result, where they actually run the, um, the um, tourist agency, and they take people on tours. So we're very into the practical. In fact, my students just launched a um, campus corporate game yesterday, where they're going to take people to get them back onto the campus, to the sites, through a game which is called Tux de Race, um, almost like a scavenger hunt where they put together all the questions and, this, um, and, and, and answers and riddles to take people out and bring them back to campus um, in this transition phase as we move out of COVID or hopefully move out of COVID. So yeah, so there is a practical dimension as well as a theoretical. And we okay. also liaise, yeah. sorry, I can just add, we also liaise with the industry. So we have people and um, specialists from the industry also lecturing to the students. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, I haven't done uh, qualification through you. I've just done that little short course, that pilot program. Um, and I noticed on there that your focus was much more profound than on the guiding side. It was more on the developing program so that you can also become a, let's call it a micro tour operator, um, which I think is a progression that most guides aspire to, unless they want to be employees of somebody else their whole lives. So I think that, that yeah, I think France was that was the 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 the, the um, program that was run through enterprises um, that was not in our department. That was um, CETUP, which is the continuous education program. Um, that mm. that was um, that that's not that running. Run at the oh oh yeah, the cross border one. Oh yeah, no, that was a pilot project that yes, Hannes and yes. I did the cross border thing. No, absolutely, yeah, that was a that was a pilot for National Partner of Tourism, and yeah, no, absolutely, that was to develop cross border tourism and to try and break those barriers as well. So, yeah. The barriers of cross-border tourism as opposed to the barriers of cultural versus nature versus whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then um, we, I, I equated history to the glue that binds everything together. Uh, you mentioned culture and culture as being a lens uh, because the way you perceive history differs. And there's a lot of questions that have come up on that. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but a lot of the questions refer to the history and they, they ask possibly touchy, difficult uh, aspects on how do you perceive history and what part of history do you address and why isn't this covered in history and why is that covered in history? So I, th I think you can, you can understand what all the questions are about rather than mm -hmm. going into mm -hmm. every single one of them and only answering sure. one. 
You yeah, can do a generic yeah. answer. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Francois. Look, I'm not going to name a site's name, but I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. We have in our very country where people will say only guides of X, Y, and Z may come to this site where, where it's not a public site where it's, it's semi-private or, or whatever. Um, and then, you know, because they want to give a certain version. And this is where we, we run into trouble. And I think historians as well, um, you know, people asked me many, many years ago, I mean, I've been in this game for three decades. I started when I was 10, just by the way, but anyway. And they say, um, you know, are you writing a new history? No, history is dynamic. And there is this very contested, contentious dimension. And that is where the tourist guide has got to be well equipped because you've got to give a balanced version. You cannot go out there and give a particular version of whatever. We've just come back from the Northern Cape doing um, some field work there where we're doing a case study for the National Park of Tourism. And I was gobsmacked at the range of people we saw and the different versions that are being relayed there. And we've got to find that balance. Um, and, and I think that is why context and perspective is so important. It is absolutely critical. You're not going out there on a political bandwagon. You cannot do that because then you're not what we call an ambassador of the country. Tourist guides are ambassadors. They are so critical. If, if I you know, draw up that slide that I showed right in the beginning, all these different roles that you play as a tourist guide. And that is why the impartiality, the perspective, and being able to give evidence of what you're saying is so critical um, to what you're doing. So it, you know, often people say to me, well, why don't you write a book for the tourist guides? No, the book I would write is to make tourist guides, not give them the fish, but give them how to fish. You know what I'm saying? It's so important that tourist guides do their own research, that it becomes second nature to them um, on whatever topic, on whatever site that they have this and are then able to give the most balanced um, perspective. And there's nothing wrong in saying, well, there's one version that says X, Y, and Z, and there's the other version that says A, B, and C. Um, and you put it to your guests. And yes, this is not as the one person you said, you know, People don't want to hear facts and figures. You don't have to do that. You do it in an entertaining fashion. My history classes, just to give an example, I have students telling me they'd rather come to my history class and go to a movie. I'm like, well, what's wrong with the movies if they got that bad? The point is, um, you've got to make it interesting. You've got to make it fascinating. And as you say, probably the most challenging thing about a tourist guide is reading your group. Not beforehand. You can prepare as much as what you like, but when you're standing right there in front of them and with them, you've got to pick up the vibes. What is that woman off about? What are the vibes between them? Particularly when you've got a group from, you know, people that, when it's not a family or a bubble group, as we call it. Um, you've got to be able to read that because you might have this guy from Germany who's got a certain thing and he wants precision and exact and da da da. And then you've got this fluffy chick who's come from Cape Town or from, you know, Los Angeles and she's got another and you've got to draw them all together. So it is a balancing act. It's a, it's a challenging balancing act. But if you've got that depth, you can then handle this, handle anything particularly those difficult questions about our very difficult and checkered past. Well, I've got two questions that came up here in the last couple of seconds. They refer back to what you answered about the Chinese history. It's mm -hmm. very strange because I know both of these people and they're both Hispanic. They're both mm -hmm. Spanish speaking guides. Mm -hmm. And they both asked, where can I get more information about the Chinese in Africa? <laughs> so I don't know if that means they're shifting the emphasis or what. <laughs> uh, and my, my immediate answer would be Google, but I think uh, you're here. So if you can just give us a reference to where they can get more information on it. Um, look, Francois, you know, what I can do is I can share with you some of the work that I've done on this because, um, and I, you know, I, I haven't got books that I'm selling or publishing. My, my stuff's mostly academic and papers that I've done over time. Um, but if they like, they can email me and I can send them a couple of my articles, um, which, which I've done, you know, right up until the recent past. I mean, the Chinese have been featuring all the time. In fact, you can do the whole history of South Africa through the lens of the Chinese because they've been here from, you know, Chen Ho's day, if you like, from 1600s when the first Chinese came in as free individuals. They were literally a handful. But let me tell you, the first piece of legislation that discriminated against a cultural group in this part of the world, and we've had a lot of discrimination, was against the Chinese. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to sell goods in the streets because you know why? The Dutch found it very competitive. And we see this happening again in the ZAR on the mines where the Chinese are taking the bread out of our mouths. They're not allowed to sell. They're not allowed to, because why? The Chinese were prepared to sell cheaper. They were prepared to give people on tick. Um, and there's wonderful, wonderful work. I mean, I would like to push a colleague of mine who wrote a really beautiful book, Daryl Lacone, called All Under Heaven. And he is a Chinese um, a descendant, fourth generation, and he writes about his ancestry. And it, it's a, just a gem of a book because it takes you through his history, 
um, three generations, very much like the Swans book of the US. Um, and there's the, the movie called The Joy Luck Club, which you might know, which gives the story of the Chinese in America. We have a similar story here. People confuse the history of the Chinese in our country with the 65,000 indentured laborers that came out from 1904 to 1910. Um, those Chinese were returned, um, mostly. That is still something I'm working on. But um, these Chinese were treated worse than the unskilled laborers from Southern Af from, our, from the Black South Africans and from our neighboring uh, countries. They were, they were put in compounds, they had three-year contracts, their money was far less, and they were treated abominably. Um, they were part of the history. But the free Chinese, which my own doctoral research looks at, are the people that were outside of those compounds and the role that they played. And then, of course, the Chinese are featured um, with the new government. They were excluded from you know, the um, whole story of being um, um, EE compliant. Uh, and therefore um, felt that they were done in again. And so um, there was a whole court case about that and again featured the Chinese. So right from the beginning, we can pull this thread through the Chinese, um, but people are welcome to email me and I will put something together and send it to you. Okay, okay. okay. I, I just need to make a comment here because I see lots of uh, questions coming up on the chat. Um, there are more than 900 people attending this chat. So we can't send emails <laughs> to every single one of them that has requested with the specific information. So yeah. what the department will do is that they will post a link uh, which will contain the, the, the two presentations and the answers to the questions will also be provided. Uh, I think uh, possibly if uh, Prof Harris can provide an email address and Prof Compton as well for direct questions later, that might be useful. But uh, it's impossible to send emails to all of you, all of you although we'd love to. Uh, yeah. it's, you're just too many, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, what I can okay, do, Francois, hmm. sorry, Francois, yeah. what I can possibly do is I'll send um, to um, Yvesh and your Celeste, um, you know, three or three or so articles, and then they will be available for people to get them from the NDT site. It will also be great. I've got 940 students that I'm dealing with at the moment, so I don't think I'll be able to have 900 emails. <laughs> but I'm yeah, glad you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. There's a question about renaming of streets and areas uh, and whether that damages history. Um, I, look, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing throughout the world. You're going to have the naming of places. You're going to have statues removed. You're going to have, because that is what happens. But as a tourist guide, you're able to unpack that story. Um, you know, if, if you arrive at Oliver Tambo, you, you talk about Oliver Tambo. It's wonderful to be at this uh, this. this part of our struggle history, the new democratic South Africa, but take a step back for those people who would be interested, depending again on who your, your, your uh, clients are, or your guests are, you will then refer to the Jan Smuts airport and where that played a role. And Jan Smuts, for all his good, bad and ugly, he was a pivotal individual in not only South African history, but in global history. He, you know, and mm -hmm. you as a naturalist, he was there up at that level, you know, and there were a whole lot of things going on, on um, there as well. So again, when there are place names, changes, I think it's important because that actually gives you an in to talk about the past and, and to explain how things have changed. Yeah, it actually introduces you exactly. through the mouth exactly. of the client. Of exactly. The and, and that is where you whip them in. I mean, I know we, 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 we're not going to only just give, you know, bubblegum tours. We're going to get people to understand things. Um, that is what it's all about, building bridges, being that ambassador. So if somebody asks you, why is this place called X, Y, and Z? Well, yes, it's caused this, and this is the reason. But if we go a little bit back, it was called that. And, it, and you don't necessarily have to have a viewpoint. In fact, you don't have a viewpoint. You give them the issues as they've evolved um, and, and, and not get into any sort of you know, sensitive battle, <laughs> as it were. Yeah. Well, we, we still have a few minutes. Um, and... I must confess, I wasn't watching your presentation. I was looking at uh, a little menu that said questions and answers and another one that said chat while I was listening to you. So <laughs> I actually missed out on the timeline. And there are two questions that refer to the timeline. So I, I can't say that it's not on the timeline because I wasn't looking at it. But mm -hmm. um, somebody asked about the Anglo-Zulu Wars and somebody else asked about the, the Koza Wars and uh, why they're not mentioned. I love that question. Because um, I actually had a slide as well, which I took out where I spoke about, and it actually comes from a very good book that was called um, um, uh, by Morris, and he talks about um, the journey of history, right? It came out just after the New Democratic, and it's, it's really a good book to, to use, use when, when you are a tourist guide. 
And in that book, he refers to history as being like a movie script. And I always share this with my students. History is like a movie script. In fact, it's in their reader, which I have right in front of me here. History is like a movie script. Um, a lot is left out because it seems unnecessary. The kind of extraneous detail that could only confuse the audience. When you as a tourist guide are talking to your tourists and you see that, ah, I'm losing them, you then stop and you go in a different direction because you've got to keep them on board. Um, but you leave out stuff. Um, and then the question is, selected detail is often enough to contain and convey the plot and describe the characters and what they did. But who Your selected? image is frozen. I don't know if it's my data. Sorry? Uh, I think I'm I said, okay. I've lost you. Um, I don't know. I'm I don't know here. if it's me or if it's your signal. I think I'm still here, Francois. Okay, yeah, you're back. Well, you, I'm you, back. Yeah. One of us is back. Prof, Prof Hardis was always there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, yeah, you not, no, not at all. So, so just going back to this book by Morris, it's called Every Step of the Way, The Journey of, um, to Freedom in South Africa. It's a wonderful book because it's got a lot of um, quotes from people on the ground um, and the individuals. And so the question I'm saying is that history is a bit like a movie script. Think about those CDs that you buy for your kids or used to buy for your kids before streaming. And then there would be that section, the parts that were not in the movie. Why are those parts not in the movie? Because they made the movie too long, because they're not that important, because they digressed or whatever the case may be. And as historians and as tourist guides, we make a selection. So I always say to my students, when you're writing that biography for me or that account of something, you are the director of that movie. You are deciding what is more relevant and what can I leave out? But you can't put everything in. And so with a timeline, you're absolutely right. There was a timeline. I didn't create that timeline. It was just one of many that I use. I give my students a number that they can see how timelines differ. You're going to put on that what you think is pertinent. So that is where the historian is very instrumental. When somebody writes a history, a colleague of mine has just put out a new history, um, Professor Simpson. It's just coming out next month, in fact, it'll be launched. And I'm very interested to see what he's put in and what he's left out. Because you can't put everything in. And remember also, history is not linear. There's so many things happening. I say to my students when we're doing Southern African history and we're talking about Mishushwe, I say to them, well, what the hell's going on in Europe now? And they're like, what? They've done a global history course in the first semester. They don't make the connection. Bismarck's running around with his helmet on his head, putting Germany together. Mishushwe is fighting and being diplomatic and getting the Boers and the Brits and everybody to sort out so that he eventually has one of the first independent kingdoms in Southern Africa and becomes an independent Lesotho eventually. So we take history and we've got to squash it onto paper and we've got to make it linear. And you as the guide have to squash it into a mono sort of story. There are lots of things going on. So it's not a case of leaving anything out. Um, a, a timeline, I always say history books should be written in columns. So that you can be looking at what's going on all over the place simultaneously, because you know that's what it is. Human nature is very, very diversified and very multi-layered. So it's not intentionally leaving anything out. Um, it's just what do you focus on? What do you decide to talk about? Those layers I was talking about when I mentioned the different places that I gave as example, you decide what works with that particular audience and how you keep them spellbound. Okay, I fully agree with you. And I think I'd like to just add a little bit there. It also depends a lot on the itinerary that you have and the length of it. Mm, um, mm, mm. You have a three-day tour, you can't cover what you can cover in a 21-day tour. So you have to do what's relevant at the time where you are. And at the same time, you must be able to link it later on in the tour to what is relevant in that location mm. so that you can bring it all together as a whole. Absolutely. And it's just not possible to do it on a three-day tour, mm. whereas on no, a 21-day, absolutely. you can do a lot more. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think that's, that's that nice. golden uh, thread. A, a thread that runs through the whole tour. Mm -hmm. um, and you have here another question. Let's see, what's the time? Yeah, there's still time for this one. Uh, it's a strange one. It says, I have, I, I have read that Robben Island was called Penguin Island by the Khoisan, and there was a sandbank connecting the island to Bloberg. Could you comment on that? Um, I must be absolutely honest with you. I have looked for any kind of connectivity um, and probably Prof Compton would be better <laughs> equipped to answer a question like that because, um, you know, with a sandbank, there's no telling. Um, and what I would do, and I always say to my students, when we have things like that, we say, it is said, urban legend, it is, a, you know, and, and it adds spice to the story, but cover your back. Because if you do not have that evidence, you can't say it's a fact. 
Um, and to date, we still, we don't have anything. There's Prof Compton come back so he can say, sorry, Prof Compton, I thought you had disappeared. So let's hand over to the specialist on the coast. Well, no, I, I, uh, my ears perked up at that. And I just say, you know, um, in geology, we call a sand spit that connects an island to the mainland a tombolo, which is just Italian for sand spit. And if you go to Bloberg Strand, uh, like where the Blue Peter uh, Hotel is, a lot of people know that, a uh, common water hole, you can look there, there's a little island offshore and you can see a tombolo connecting it to the mainland. And at low tide, you can walk across that island and maybe just get your feet a little wet. Now, interestingly, there is also sand between Robin Island and the mainland. The difference being, of course, the sand there is not thick or big enough to walk across, of course. <laughs> yeah, but there is sand there on the bottom. And interesting, and historically, when the ships came with anchors, and even today, mm. you know, most of Table Bay is bare rock. Yeah, yeah. Very hard Con for an that anchor. continental rift. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hard for an anchor to find purchase. And so what they would do is park in the road. And the road was the body of sand that is in the lee of that wave energy that I mentioned and into which an anchor can be sunk and have find a grip. So there is sand there behind Robin Island, just like there is in, that, in the Bloberg Strand, but it's a much smaller amount. Well, it's a, not enough sand to connect. And even over many, many millions of years, it's unlikely that it's ever going to connect. When mm -hmm. Robin Island would connect to the mainland is when sea level dropped. Mm -hmm. So it used to be the strand line was out beyond Robin Island. And then Robin Island was just a funny flat top hill on the landscape. So Thanks. I really enjoyed uh, your talk, Karen, and I, it reminds me of history. And the thing about geologists is we're into deep history. And of course, that's still part of history, but it's one that's often not seen Acknowledged. or appreciated. Yeah. So Absolutely. I really enjoyed your talk and I enjoyed the aspect of connecting historical stuff, written stuff, with mm. the deeper stuff written in the rocks and in the mm. fossils Absolutely. and so forth. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you both. Uh, I think this is now where I have to play the nasty cop and say 12.30, we are being cut off. <laughs> I'll have to say thank you very much. You were both excellent. The answers, the questions that you answered were great, and both presentations were very good. I don't know if you, Vashni, or somebody from NDT wants to say something, but uh, we've reached uh, basically the end of the time. And thanks to everybody that was here and listened. Thank you, Francois. Right. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Cheers. Happy Cheers, John. Cheers, Karen. Cheers, Francois. Thank you. Cheers. Bye, Francois. Take care. Bye bye.